bill move on to House File 403, which is Representative Herr's bill. Uh, 403 is regarding employers prohibited from inquiring about past pay. Uh, Representative Herr, would you like to move that House File 403 be recommended to be re-referred to the Labor, Industry, Veterans, and Military Affairs Finance and Policy Committee? Yes, that is my motion, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Herr moves her bill. Uh, please go ahead, Representative Herr, and tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I, I'm keenly aware that we only have 30 minutes left at committee. I know you're very good at stopping us at 10 o'clock, so uh, we'll get through this quickly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, this morning I'm presenting House File 403, the Preventing Discrimination Act. This bill is very straightforward. It simply prevents an employer from asking what a job applicant's pay history is when they are negotiating salary. However, this bill does allow a job applicant to voluntarily disclose their pay history, and if they do so, an employer is allowed to use that information as necessary. But above all else, House File 403 takes us one step closer to closing the pay gap in Minnesota. The pay gap is very real in Minnesota. Women get paid 80 cents on the dollar for what a man makes, and this drops even lower for women of color. I'm not going to uh, speak to the stats today because I think we're all very familiar with that. So I'm just going to leave that part out of it uh, in the interest of time. Uh, with House File 403, we work, uh, we work to close the pay gap, saying that a job applicant would no longer be forced to disclose the pay history during their salary negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some uh, of you may be uh, naturally asking how that helps us close the pay gap, and it helps close the pay gap because the pay history question can give an employer a built in excuse to pay a job applicant less because they're basing that decision solely off someone's pay history. So by ending the pay history question, a job applicant's future, way, uh, future wage will no longer be anchored down by their past. And we can break the cycle of discrimination that can allow women and BIPOC sometimes through the uh, entirety of their career. I, want, I just wanted to point out that uh, it is important to note that 18 states, including Alabama and North Carolina, have already passed their own pay history question. Um, and so it's time for Minnesota to do the same thing. Today, I do have two testifiers. Uh, the, fir the first is Professor Jill Hasday from the University of Minnesota Law School, School who will give a uh, historical deep dive into how the pay history question has perpetuated the pay gap, as well as Commissioner Lucero from the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to my first testifier, Professor Jill Hasday. All right, uh, Professor Hasday. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Chair Becker Finn and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me. My name is Jill Hasday. I'm a distinguished McKnight University professor and the Centennial Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota Law School. I teach and write about sex discrimination and constitutional law, among other subjects. In my time today, I want to make one simple but fundamental point. Asking about pay history perpetuates pay discrimination. I'm going to start with some historical background before describing the current state of the law and the need for legislative action. Before 1963, it was perfectly legal to pay women less. This type of discrimination was pervasive and out in the open. For instance, help wanted ads would list one salary for male workers and a lower salary for women performing the same jobs. Many hoped that the Federal Equal Pay Act of 1963 would end unequal pay between men and women. But 58 years after the law's enactment, an enormous wage differential persists. The median earnings for women working full-time and year-round in 2019 were just 82% of the median earnings for male full-time year-round workers, with Black women earning just 63% of white men's wages and Hispanic women earning just 55%. The latest studies estimate that the wage gap will not close for white women until 2055, for black women until 2133, and for Hispanic women until 2220. One important reason for this wage gap is that employers frequently ask job applicants about their pay history before deciding what salary to offer. This widespread practice means that workers often cannot escape pay discrimination by getting a new job. If a woman's first boss pays her less than men earn for doing the same work, the consequences can reverberate for a lifetime. Discrimination early in a career can lock someone into a permanent cycle of unequal pay. Unfortunately, federal law does not prohibit 
employers from asking job applicants about their pay history. Instead, federal law accepts, even facilitates the practice. Employers sued under the Federal Equal Pay Act for paying women less will commonly defend their unequal pay practices by contending that they set salaries by relying on a job applicant's pay history. The United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, which covers Minnesota, has accepted this argument, holding that it doesn't violate the Equal Pay Act for an employer to pay women less if the employer determined pay scales by relying on pay history. I'll repeat this because it's important. Federal law does not stop employers from paying women less for doing the exact same work as a man, so long as the employer can point to the woman's pay history as the basis for the discrimination. The ability to rely on pay history provides employers with a ready-made excuse for underpaying women, but efforts to amend federal law so far have been unsuccessful. A growing number of states and localities have responded to this problem by enacting their own laws to bar employers from questioning job applicants about pay history. These laws are aimed at ending the cycle of pay discrimination so everyone can receive equal pay for equal work. The laws benefit women and anyone else with a history of being underpaid. To date, approximately 18 states and 17 localities have prohibited employers from asking job applicants about their pay history. A 2020 study by researchers at Boston University School of Law found that the enactment of state, history, state uh, pay history bans led more employers to list salaries in their online help wanted ads and increase pay for job changers by an average of 5%, with the, the pay of female job changers increasing by an average of 8%, and the pay of African-American job changers increasing by an average of 13%. In other words, adopting state pay, ban state pay history bans made workers as a whole better off while also reducing both gender and racial wage gaps. Minnesota should join this reform movement. Every Minnesotan deserves equal pay for equal work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. We'll go to the next testifier, uh, Commissioner Lucero. Please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Hi, good morning. Um, good morning, Chair Beckerfin and members of the committee. Thanks for having me here today. Um, yep, I'm here today to speak on House File 403, um, the Preventing Pay Discrimination Act. This bill will help prevent discrimination from taking place when Minnesotans are applying for positions. Specifically, House File 403 prohibits an employer from asking an applicant to disclose their pay history from previous employment. This bill protects individuals who do not want to disclose information about their pay history. As Professor Hasday laid out, racial and gender pay discrimination is historical, so we have to act with intention to end it. When women are paid less than men with similar experience, similar qualifications, and seniority for the same job, we have to look at what policies or practices maybe formal, maybe informal, um, are existing that are perpetuating inequality in pay, resulting in this pay gap. So we have to be intentional, and House File 403 does just that. Um, um, I'm not going to talk about the specific numbers um, uh, for um, what women make compared to men um, for the purposes of time, but um, we know that across the board, women are making substantially less than men, and that's impacting women of color even more. We also know that Black, Latino, and Indigenous men also earn considerably less than white men. So to change this, we have to be intentional. Uh, now, the use of the pay history question is one of the practices that is neutral on its face, but in practice, it causes inequality in pay. When future salaries are anchored to past pay, gender and racial pay discrimination can follow Minnesotans from job to job. This locks someone into a cycle of unequal pay, potentially throughout their entire career. So instead, relying on experience, skills, track record, and responsibilities of the position ensures pay discrimination doesn't occur in the first place. The Preventing Pay Discrimination Act would help break this cycle um, and can stop, help stop pay discrimination from occurring. When Minnesota passes this bill, as we've heard, we will join a groundswell of states that have already ended the pay history question. States such as Alabama, Colorado, and North Carolina have all agreed that by ending the pay history question, we can take important steps to help close racial and gender pay gaps that exist. Um, and Professor Hasday noted the um, uh, 
report that was published by Boston University over the summer showing the pay history question ban works. In these states where that, that ban is in place, there was an 8% increase in pay for all women and a 13% increase in pay for black workers. So we see by being intentional and eliminating the pay gap, families and children can better afford life's essentials like housing, healthcare, and education. I want to thank Representative Herr for authoring this bill and Chair Becker Finn and the committee for giving this critical bill a, bill a hearing. Our department is excited to support this bill and help Minnesota um, move one step closer to closing the pay gap. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We've got one more testifier on the list. Uh, so we'll go to the testifier and then to member questions. Uh, I have uh, Mike Hickey, if you could introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. or not, um, just uh, just looking at the list. I'm not sure if we have him signed in. So uh, with that, we'll go uh, to member questions. Uh, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative Herr, for bringing this bill. I um, am really sympathetic. I want this bill to work. I, in my career in different areas, have received less pay than, actually it was, in my experience, I was working a job and the person they hired after me, who happened to be a male, got more pay, even though I had been there longer and had had the master's degree. So, you know, I have seen this in my own life. I know it's real, but my concern about this bill is the same one I had last year. And I'm honestly, you know, disappointed that it hasn't been addressed. And it's in uh, line 1.11. Um, where it says that the employer cannot even inquire into, consider, or require disclosure. And it's the word consider, honestly. Like, I, it, it's the word consider along with the rebuttable presumption that finds discrimination. I just feel like employers will be, I've also been an employer and had to hire and make difficult decisions. And if you cannot even consider pay history, like, even if you find it out through another channel, even if they voluntarily disclose it. Now you, you give the freedom that if they voluntarily disclose it, then it is, but because of this rebuttable presumption and because of the word consider, I just feel like employers will be sort of damned if they do and damned if they don't. And, and I'm very concerned about the effect this will have. So I, I with you on the intent, I think this bill can get there, but I, I, I would like to see, um, I know there have been concerns expressed by the business community, and I think they were too late to file amendments, but I'm hoping we can continue to work on it. I would be happy to be part of working on it, um, but I'm I'm very concerned that this will just be, lead to a lot of litigation because of the word consider, and then because of the rebuttable presumption, you know, it's really, um, a really a, a tough hill to climb for employers. So I, I, I'd love you to speak to it. I'd especially like you to talk about how you, how you think the rebuttal presumption will work in practice. Do any of the other states that have a pay equity bill also have that? I, I think it's you know a strong uh, statement in the bill. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Robbins. I will also state for the record that the business community uh, cannot file amendments. It would only be uh, members of this committee that could file amendments. Uh, Representative Herr, Yes, Madam uh, Chair. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. And and I, when I saw this posted, I didn't see that it was po posted very late Friday. I didn't even realize it was posted till Saturday. And I looked into it on Monday morning early and it was too late. So I just want to say for the record, part of it is the timing. It was late. But no, I understand who actually files the amendments. Thank you. Yeah, and I, uh, I would, I would recommend, you know, when we have a, an 8:30 a.m. Uh, Tuesday morning hearing, that was one of the reasons we pushed uh, in the rules that the amendment deadline is 10 o'clock instead of 8:30. You know, most many committees have. 24 hour deadline, but we did want to give people that leeway. So I would encourage folks uh, to, to check out the bills when they're posted on, on Thursday or sometime, you know, we'll post them as soon as we're able to, uh, but did have some changes to what was, uh, what was available to be heard as far as committee reports, moving things along. Uh, with that, we'll move on to representative long. I'm sorry, Madam chair. Could someone respond to my questions? Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Representative Herr. 
Uh, yeah, Manage, thank you, Madam Chair. I can respond quickly. And, and, and Representative Robbins, I appreciate your, your concern. I remembered it from last year. I just wanted you to know that very late last night, uh, I did uh, reach out to the group that was going to testify today. They had a similar concern over that language. And uh, I've actually been uh, working with them and uh, I asked them, actually they sent me some revisions probably 10 o'clock last night that I told them I would work with them on. So I, I hear your concerns. I do just wanna say really quick that, you know, I, I'm, I don't see the, the issue with an employer not being able to consider this. I mean, employers do uh, a lot of, uh, uh, industry research to find out what pay ranges for certain types of job is, but they often use that to tell somebody why they have to get paid within that range. And so they are already collecting their own data to tell somebody what it is they believe somebody should get paid for a certain type of job. There are best practices uh, in HR, human capital management, organizational management that actually guides a lot of this work. And that if somebody then were really uh, looking at a candidate and seeing who is the most qualified for it, they would be basing the salary based on the information they've gathered, which they always tell us is it is practices we do at the legislature when we look at to hire jobs. And that then they base it on the person's experience, how they interviewed when they came in, the questions that are asked by that uh, employer, and then they base the salary based on that. So truthfully, considering the salary from the past, uh, that word does not concern me because I know what it is that companies do. I've worked for 15 years in the private sector where I hired people. And um, there are many, many processes and procedures in place in which that's why we don't disclose our uh, pay, pay ranges because we really don't want people to know, right? And so there are a lot of mechanisms in place that shift the balance of power with the employer. So my, I'm not concerned as much about that specific language piece of it. Um, I don't know if one of my other testifiers, um, Rebecca, um, Commissioner Lucero, has anything else to add to that. Uh, yeah. Commissioner Lucero. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks for thanks for the question. Um, I do want to um, clarify that this is covered um, um, in detail. We did hear this concern, and it is covered um, as part of Subdivision 8C. Um, Nothing in this subdivision shall prevent an applicant for employment from voluntarily and without prompting disclose pay history for the purposes of negotiating wages. So um, absolutely, um, um, if an applicant would like to disclose their um, their own um, pay history, they are welcome to do so. Um, the, the point is, is that something that they can choose to keep um, private and shouldn't be considered um, at the end of the day in the conversation on how much somebody's getting paid. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Lucero. And we do have four people on, on the list to weigh in. So uh, we'll move to Representative Long next. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I um... A quick comment and then a question. I just wanted to note that I, I think this bill does to, uh, strike what seems to me to be precisely the right balance between uh, allowing an employee to present their uh, salary history if they want it to be negotiated, but not uh, allowing an employer to use it uh, on the front end, which I think creates all the problems that we've heard from witnesses and that uh, you know I've observed when I've, I've done hiring practices in the past is um, one thing I wanted to ask about is um, I know that for caregiving or people who take time out of the workforce, um, certainly there are some men who do that, but I, my understanding is still the uh, great majority of folks who take time off to care for kids and then re-enter the workforce are women. Um, and if you were simply looking at salary history that might be dated uh, from before they uh, took time off for work uh, or looked at you know their immediate employment history that that would uh, conceivably uh, significantly impact, I think, the salary for somebody who's getting rehired after a break. And I'm curious if that's been, been looked into or if that if there's data on, on how that impacts um, people getting rehired when they're entering the workforce. Uh, Representative Herr. Thank you, Representative Long. And I'll just speak really quickly to that. Maybe one of my other testifiers can as well. But we do know, so I don't, I think I might have mentioned this before, that my doctorate dissertation is actually on uh, uh, advancement in pay of women of color. And uh, we do have data that show that because women are still primary the caregiver, that when they do return to the workforce, that that, that does have an impact on their pay and that they almost uh, never come back at the same pay in which uh, they left the workforce in. And so I'm just gonna leave it at that since my dissertation is very long. And so I'm gonna let one of my other uh, testifiers speak in case they have something else to add to it. All right, I'm not sure which one of you wants to take it, but go ahead. Um, I agree that's an, another problem. I mean, and maybe something I could say is this bill alone is an important step forward, but it's not the only step forward, right? The wage gap is this enormous problem, and this is one of the steps. Discrimination also against women who leave the workforce, and I think they're overly penalized. That's 
that, maybe that could be another legislative agenda. But I, I think this, they're all the piece. They all kind of the same direction. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Becker, PIN members. Uh, I do have a wonder if uh, Representative Kerr could clarify a few things. Um, to start with, um, this isn't for her, but this is for the chair. Uh, we were advised about this bill coming up at, uh, I believe it was 8.33 on Friday night. Uh, and we had a number of our members reach out to the different groups. And by the time they were actually able to get into it and talk to their members and get a consensus on it, um, it was too late for the amendment deadline because it was so short time period, 10 o'clock Monday morning. Um, by the time they can get, get together, it's eight o'clock Monday morning and two hours is not enough time to uh, put things together. So it's unfortunate of the, of the uh, timing of when this bill was added. But we did, uh, after, after the uh, uh, deadline, uh, Minnesota Employment Law Council uh, provided some information. And I'm wondering if uh, Representative Herr could uh, answer some of the questions they have and the concerns they have one of them is uh, in uh, lines uh, 1.23 to 2.2, subpart C, the phrase without prompting disclosure. That could be uh, result in, likely result in confusion and dispute over whether a particular discussion or inquiry somehow prompted a pay history, and that could create all sorts of headaches. Um, also in subpart C, um, uh, the uh, Minnesota Empl Employment Legal Council proposes that if an employee voluntarily discloses her pay history, that that inf information may be used in the party's negotiations without limitation, regardless whether an offer was previously, previously presented. Um, there's a couple other current concerns that they have with this bill. And I'm wondering if you could just uh, answer that part of it, because I, it is very uh, confusing whether somebody uh, volunteered to give it or was prompted. It's, and what you're forcing this into is all these uh, meetings and stuff being recorded, uh, keeping that information for how many years before they can uh, actually dispose of it because the legal, they, the number of years that they have to bring uh, legal action. Um, so I. I think I like the concept of this bill, but until those issues are taken care of, it's going to be very difficult to vote for this bill. Uh, so first, I want to say that uh, you know the the notice went out uh, four and a half days uh, before this hearing, and uh, you know it, it can be a challenge sometimes to keep up with the work that we have to do here. But uh, you know it's. Um, <laughs> it's it comes with the job during session, and so I will note the frustration, but I can also say that I didn't hear um, personally not one single person, um, you know, elected or otherwise reached out to me with any concerns about this bill ahead of time at any point until until the hearing today. Uh, Representative Herr, if you want to go forward uh, to answer Representative Johnson's questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Becca Finn, and thank you for the questions, Chair uh, uh, Representative Johnson. So I do just want to add that this bill was carried by Chair Moran and also uh, Chair Mahoney and other bienniums. And so this bill is not a new bill. This has been out there for a really long time, and yet we have not heard concerns until right up to you know hours before this uh, bill was heard. I am very aware of M MELC's uh, concerns. I actually received the concerns at 7.30 last night. I talked to them, called them, I received revisions from them later that evening as well. And so, and so I'm and just uh, to be aware that uh, I've actually talked to the commissioners, uh, the Department of Human Rights around a couple of these bullet points that we are saying, we absolutely would, uh, would look at the language and see any adjustments that could be made. And so I know you are concerned, Representative Johnson, but we have made a commitment to uh, Molly, who I spoke with, who was representing MELC, that we will work with them on this bill language. I do just want to address a specific bullet point of 1.23 to 2.22. I specifically asked them, well, what does uh, prompted mean? And I was given an example that it was really didn't uh, 
um, they, I wasn't given any concrete example of what would be ambiguous about what prompting meant. And so I said, I, what I need is some concrete like language changes that they would like to see and not just that, well, just take it out completely. And so I, I agree with your concerns, but we are, I am working directly with them because I want to address the issue and not just then either get rid of the bill or the language itself because people don't like it. It is about as ambiguous as somebody was prompted, as ambiguous as when a woman says no means no. And so to me, it is not ambiguous in that way. And if they could find better language for me to include, I absolutely will consider it. Uh, thank you, Representative Herr. Uh, we've got uh, one more question, and we do have a hard stop today. It's the uh, the virtual equivalent of having to get out of the room for uh, rules committee. So, uh, Representative Scott. Uh, Representative Scott, I think you're muted. Thank, there we go. Thank you, Madam Chair. And and um, thank you, Representative Herr, for this bill. And um, when I voted for it last, um, a year, last year, or a year before, I don't remember which, um, I did vote for it with reservations. And um, I do have a few questions. One is, I don't think the, it, the issue of the rebuttable presumption has been um, really addressed. And I don't know if this question is for the bill's author or for the commissioner, but do other areas of employment law um, and discrimination law have a rebuttable presumption? And what do other, st do other states have a rebuttable presumption? And um, my other question has to do with um, what if somebody is already an employee of a company and so that the, the person doing the interview already knows what that person is making, what their current salary is, um, how is that handled? Uh, Representative Herr. Um, I, I do know the answer to those questions, uh, the questions. Thank you, Representative Scott. Uh, but I'm going to let uh, the commissioner, she can probably be more succinct around uh, what other states are doing around that. Commissioner Lucero. Great. Thank you, Chair becker -Fan. Thank you for the question, Peggy Scott. So uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Representative Scott. Um, so, um, so first and foremost, um, a really good example of prompting disclosure is somebody writing right on the application itself and saying, um, what is your current wage? That's an example of a prompt. And it might be helpful to note that there are many, many questions that um, HR professionals and employers, I do every single day, I am prohibited from asking because we know they lead to discriminatory outcome. For instance, you cannot ask, are you pregnant? Are you gonna become pregnant? Are you married? Are you gonna be uh, spending time with your family? So this is just adding to a long list of questions that we already um, don't ask because we want to make sure that we have um, better outcomes when it, um, when it comes to um, gender and race discrimination. And we know this pay gap exists, and so we need to, uh, we need to change that. Um, um, I am going to have to get back to you on some other areas. Oh, uh, what I do want to say is that there are, um, every single state has uh, similar versions of the pay history question ban, um, and there are two uh, that they have nuances, but they have two basic components over and over again. First is that they prohibit employers to ask about pay history. And second, they allow job applicants to voluntarily disclose. Um, and that is um, exactly what's laid out in this bill. Uh, a couple of the other details, um, Representative Herr has made the commitment to work with, um, with folks um, to, to see if we can change any of the language. Thank you. So, right. Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, real quick, Representative Scott. I, I didn't hear an answer to the rebuttable presumption question, and I don't know if House Research um, would have that, or maybe the bill's author can speak to that, but I think Representative Robbins sort of asked that question. It wasn't answered, and so, and I know, Representative Hur, you're going to be working on this, and I appreciate that. I just wanted that answer to kind of be addressed if possible, and you can do it offline. Uh, yeah, Representative Her, I would uh, ask you to work with the commissioner and others so that uh, that information can be provided to the committee and would uh, encourage you to have an answer to that question uh, before you have a hearing in the next committee. So uh, with that, uh, we'll, uh, Representative Her renews her motion that House File 403 be recommended to be re-referred to the Labor, Industry, Veterans, and Military Affairs Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Fenn. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott. Yes, with reservation. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. 
Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Hurt. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. No, not in the current storm. Representative Liebling. Enthusiastically, yes. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. No. Representative Novotny. Yes. Representative Farr. No. Representative Robbins. No, but I, I look forward to voting for it later. Representative Vang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. I have 12 ayes and four noes. All right. Uh, the motion passes. I will uh, remind members it's, it's, you got two options. It's I or no. Um, <laughs> it makes it much easier on our staff if you just stick to that uh, moving forward. Uh, so with that, House File 403 is recommended be referred to the Labor, Industry, Veterans, and Military Affairs, Finance, and Policy Committee. And uh, thank you, members, for the good discussion today. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.